rubbed off the certificate of debt. On everybody's account, it's done. It's, it's the grace of God. And because of him doing this, because of him putting everybody under grace, getting everybody out from under law, then the question is raised at the beginning of Romans 6, 1, shall we just continue in the sin because the grace will increase? Heck no, we died in relationship with the sin. How can we live in the sin any longer? Don't you know that all of us who have been placed into Christ Jesus have been placed into the death of him? Therefore, haven't been buried with him through placement into the death. How much more? You know, just as Christ has been raised from the dead people through the glory of the Father, so we too should walk in freshness of life. Romans 6, 5, if we've been united with him like this in his death, we will also be united with him like this in his resurrection. For we know, you know Greek knowing this, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that the old man of us, the old man represented by Adam, the representative of the old creation, the old man of us, was co-crucified so that the body of the sin would be rendered powerless, made ineffective, made fruitless, made ineffective. So the body of the sin would be made powerless so that we would no longer be slaves to the sin because in Romans 6, 7, anyone that's died has been acquitted of the sin. Well, that's Colossians 2, 14. Certificate of debt nailed to the cross. Once Jesus died on our behalf, then you erased all the record of guilt because Romans 6, 7, once a person has died, they're acquitted of the sin. And then Romans 6, 8, Romans 6, 8, you know, since we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Well, interesting statement in Romans 6, 8. Since we died with Christ, that's the fact. He died on behalf of all people, therefore all people died. The, the certificate of debt is erased once and for all for everybody. Okay? Since we died with Christ, what is the real meaning of belief in the context of Romans 6, 8? What does belief really mean? Well, in this case, Romans 6, 8 indicates that we believe that we, the same group that died with Christ, we, as having been put to death, now as new creation living on the side of resurrection, we will also live with him. We'll live with him. I mean, he went to the cross on behalf of everybody's behalf. He resurrected on behalf of everybody. So one day everybody's going to live with him. Well, Romans 6, 8, again. Since we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Romans 6, 9. For since Christ has been raised from the dead people, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to the sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to the God. I'm saying the God because that's what it is in Greek. But nonetheless, in Romans 6, 9, again, we know that Christ has been raised from the dead. People never to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to the sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to the God. Romans 6, 11, in the same way, be constantly accounting to your own self that you've died to the sin, whoever you are. And on the side of resurrection, be constantly accounting that you're living to the God in Christ Jesus, because that's your new identity in Christ Jesus. The gift of God is that you have a new identity in Christ Jesus, whoever you are. Well, this is an amazing grace point that he gets into in Romans 6. But it's also saying not only is it grace as far as the record of sin being erased at the cross and the resurrection imputing his righteousness to everybody, but it's also a grace revealed in Romans 6 that takes away the power of sin. Because in Romans, it's just an amazing statement that, well, I, I'm tempted to get into Romans 7 already. I'm really tempted to get into Romans 7. Because, because Romans 7 makes the statement in Romans 7, verse 8, Romans 7, verse 8, at the end of the phrase, in Romans 7, verse 8, we find the statement, apart from law, sin is dead. I'm just going to write it real quick. Apart from law, sin is dead. So not only does a dead person have no relationship with the law, no relationship with sin, so that the guilt is removed and the forgiveness is complete, unconditional, irreversible, etc., because a dead person having died on the cross for his or her sin in the person of the representative, Jesus, who took on Adam's identity on their behalf, 
Well, he died, it was counted to the sinner, not to the saint, Jesus the resurrected for his righteousness. Then, Romans 7, 8, apart from law, sin is dead. So, not only does the death on the cross erase the guilt of sin, but it erases the relationship to the law, which could impute sin. So you've died to the law, then you died to the ability for sin to be imputed on your account. So you're under grace because you resurrected in Christ in a new creation identity and taken to heaven, Ephesians 2, 6, raised up with him, seated with him together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he would show the overwhelming riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by the grace y'all have been saved through faithfulness. Whose faithfulness? In context, the faithfulness of the one that resurrected. Given the fact that we were being dead in trespasses and sins as far as, you know, having died on the cross for our sins in the person of our representative, we certainly didn't have any faithfulness. But certainly in Colossians 2.12, there's a statement in Colossians 2.12 about how, you know, he was raised by the faithfulness of God's working when he raised him from the dead people, Colossians 2.12, you know, raised with him through the faithfulness of God's working when he raised him from the dead people. Well, you know, Ephesians 2.8, for by the grace you've been saved through faithfulness. Whose faithfulness? Certainly not ours. We were dead in sins. But his faithfulness because he resurrected for his righteousness. His faithfulness. That's why he resurrected. So we're saved by the grace through his faithfulness. Not of ourselves, the gift of God. The same gift of God he's talking about all over the place in Romans 5. And he's getting into that gift of God also in Romans 6, even to the point in Romans 6, 11, of saying, you know, unconditionally, it's true for everybody, good news, put it down in your account, that you are dead to the sin, you're forgiven, but you're living to the God in Christ Jesus, so you're abiding in his life, his spirit, and he's the true vine, and you're like a branch, and the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ is to the glory and praise of God. Philippians 1.11, the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So what I'm going to do is just conclude this one little portion of the Romans 6 by saying in prayer, Father God, I thank you that you're telling us good news in Romans 5 and 6. And there's a link between Romans 5 and Romans 6 so that there should be no chapter division in our English Bible. It should just be Romans 5 right on into 6 as part of Romans 5 because it's getting more specific about the effect of the cross for everyone that we died in relationship to the sin and that takes away the mindset that we should just sin because we should be living for him who died on our behalf and was raised on our behalf, not living for self. And Paul says that in Romans 6 as well as 2 Corinthians 5. So Father God, I just pray that you would continue to help us understand the height and the depth and the width and the length of the love of you, Jesus, that we would know this love that overthrows knowledge to the extent that we'd be filled to the measure of all of your fullness. I'm asking you, Father, to continue to reveal your grace that in the ages to come you will show because of the kindness of the one man, Jesus Christ. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen.